Our focus on one on one today is mental health, and my guest is Bukola Lamid, fondly called the Therapy Queen. She's a certified cognitive behavioral chain therapist, emotional intelligence specialist, a child mental health practitioner, and one of Africa's leading family mental health coach. She provides relatable solutions to preserve the mental and emotional wellness for every member of the family through counseling training, therapy, and advocacy interventions. Wakala is the founder of the Safety Republic International an organization that is using the best 21st century skill set to influence healthy narratives in family, life, parenting, and childhood development. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. Okay, so um, my first question, I'm going to go straight to it and ask, look, depression, anxiety, mental health, it has become like the 21st century buzzword. Everybody's using it. And everybody's, you know, talking about any small thing, oh, I'm depressed. And, you know, can you just break it down for us? What does mental health mean? What does depression uh, mean beyond just the fact that it has become now? Okay, thank you so much for that question. You know, every time when we have opportunity to talk about mental health, we try to break it down to the basic, you know, definition so that people can relate with it. Everybody has mental health. Just like the way you have your physical health, you have your spiritual health, whatever health that you have, is just the same way you have mental health. Mental health is like the state of your mind. Hmm. How does your mind work? How do you regulate it? How do you manage it? What goes in, what comes out? That is just a basic meaning. So everybody has mental health. According to World Health Organization in 19, 2005, they define mental health. I hope I'll be able to define it word to word. They said mental health is a state of well-being. Okay. Where someone can relate with themselves, relate with the environment, cope with the everyday stresses of life. Mm. So we should be able to understand that life comes with its challenges. And you must recognize these challenges, then you have the capacity to face the challenges and bounce back because there will always be challenges so that is mental health that means you have a good if you have the capacity to cope with everyday stresses of life mm. okay and you have the capability you know to give back to the society that's another part of a good mental health once you're able to take care of yourself you can cope with the everyday stresses of life then you can now give back to the society so we consider you having a good mental health when those things are not in place then it becomes a mental illness so mental health is more or less like your emotional well-being your social well-being your spiritual well-being your physical whatever well-being everything to yes one. to one once everything can work then you have a good mental health okay i, I wanted to find out it seems like in this time that we're in this there's, there's a lot of um awareness about mental health, but there's still a lot of stigma despite the awareness. Why is that? Yeah, you know, we've come a long way and yeah, mental health has been stigmatized right from the beginning. So nobody wants to uh, f you know, face the reality that something is wrong with them. You know, we have lived for over so many years, we have lived in a society where people have been trained not to express how they feel. People have been trained to suck everything in. You know, people have been trained to wear what we call mask. So you're not feeling fine, but you don't want people to see your vulnerability. We were not trained to accept our vulnerability. So if you now cannot manage that, those vulnerabilities and they come out, it's a bit weird for people. Then they think that something is wrong with you. Okay, so now this leads me to my next question. How do we begin to change that? Because I find that it's a very... Um, I'll speak for Nigeria. I'll speak for... It's a very cultural thing to want to say, you see... Um, you know, don't tell your problem to somebody, don't share this, you know, be a man, be a woman, you're not the first person that it has happened to. So how do we now begin to draw the line to, okay, I'm not going to share my problem with anybody, but this thing is driving me crazy. I want to man up, but at the same time, I just sometimes just want to be vulnerable. Is it something in our culture that we have become, um, that we have trained ourselves that we can be vulnerable, um, you know, and open up when we have problems how do we begin to you know solve this 
Yeah, we, we need to ch start changing our mentality. How? How do we How? do that? We need to understand that vulnerability is strength. Then we need to understand that every emotion is valid. Because people believe when you are sad is a, is a bad sign. I mean, it is okay to be sad. What is not okay is to stay sad. There are two different things. So when we start changing this, um, this mentality, this stigma around, oh, you're not supposed to, like what you said, man up, suck it up, uh, it's over. You know, I tell people in mental health, we don't believe in forgiving and forgetting is a scam because you see the way god you know wired the brain you can't forget but you have the capacity to forgive but once an event comes that triggers your memory there's somewhere in the brain where every event of life is stored. So once you are triggered, it comes back to your memory. But because of the environment that we stay, people would rather not want to talk about it. That is the mentality. That is the conditioning that we have lived with so, for so many years. That's why it's strange for people, for, for me to come and tell you, that, oh, I think I'm not feeling fine. And the next thing, the person will say, no, no, it's okay, drop it, is that all? No, forget about it. You can't just forget about an emotion. You have, you must express an emotion. You must feel an emotion. If you don't feel it, it won't go away. What you only do if you don't feel it is you repress it. And one thing about emotions is, emotions that is stored up for a long time becomes toxic. So that's why you see, emotions can be in your system for several years but when it comes when it's coming out that time you will not have the ability to manage it it will just burst in your face you you could do something you can't manage so what we are trying to say now to change it, that narrative is once you're feeling something recognize it very very important if you are sad recognize that you are sad understand why you are sad Look at it. Once you are trying to dissect that emotion, it becomes powerless. Mm. But that is the opposite of what we were taught. So when, when we have a feeling, we were taught not to think about it, to push it aside. But you see, emotions don't go away, like I told you. They stay in... Can you, you, would, you would believe that recent studies even show that emotions, that emotions are linked with medical health. So sometimes when you are so stressed you could have headache emotions has been linked to have people having diabetics emotions have been linked to people having stroke because those things are chemicals in your system that goes to disrupt the normal function of the body system so now the narrative how do we go about it we need to change the mentality the mindset around sadness for instance every emotion is valid like i said the other time i said if you feel happy, you should be able to regulate happiness as well. There is no good or bad emotion. We are the one that gives interpretation to emotions. I give an example. I'm, I'm angry. My anger may be a positive emotion. How? I failed an exam. And I'm so angry and disappointed at myself. Instead of me translating that anger into something negative that can injure me, I could translate it to a positive anger that will help me to pass my exams when, when next I'm writing. Okay. So there's nothing like good or bad emotion. What we have is healthy and unhealthy emotion. Uh, we'll take a short break. And when we come back from the break, you tell us more about our emotions. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. You're still watching one on one, and our focus today is on mental health. And we still have Buki Lamid here with us. You're, so you're talking about the emotion that no emotion is good, no emotion is bad. So um, now let me go back to the home or to raising children, because you know we tell them, oh, it's not good to be sad, it's not good to be um, angry, it's not good to be. How has a parent now, or has a teacher, as a caregiver? What do I need to know and learn in simple terms in teaching children that, okay, like you said, that being sad is not a bad thing sometimes. So how do I begin to teach this to a child and then it becomes part of his or her life as they grow older? All right, thank you. So from the very basic, emotions are just our messengers. A lot of people don't know that we are the master of our emotions. But when we don't have the capa capacity to manage it, they become our masters. So right from when children are quite young, you let them understand that emotions are your messengers. 
But how do you send them on an errand is when you feel, when you express them. Mm. So you are not supposed to hold a particular emotion just because you don't want people to for you don't want people to see you in that particular state. I mean, when you want to cry, a lot of times crying is therapeutic. A lot of people don't know the glands that secrete the water for crying actually is therapeutic to the system. There's an hormone that is released. Oh, really? Yes, there's somewhere in China where if you're feeling very overwhelmed, yes. you go there, they call, they call the place a crying temple. So you go, you find a place, you sit and cry. Oh, wow. You would notice that sometimes when you cry, you feel a bit of ease. Yes. So there's a science behind crying. But because there's a label to cry, in this part of the world, that when you cry, women. you show you show vulnerability mm -hmm. or you're yeah. weak. And like I said from the beginning, vulnerability is strength. Mm -hmm. In fact, for you to have the ability to express yourself is strength on its own. So while we grew up as children, uh, adults killed that part of us. So that's why you see a lot of people cannot even stand up for themselves. They can't make decisions on their own because those emotions are supposed to build up those things. So what should the killed. adults begin to do now? What should parents and teachers begin to do now and differently? Every emotions are valid. Okay. When I on. do training for teachers or parents or whatever, when we're talking about emotions, I make them write some things out. Those things are those statements are very very important. Emotion. Every emotion is valid. It is okay not to be okay for some time. Then there are no negative or positive emotion. It's only healthy and unhealthy emotions. My emotions are my messengers. You know, those are the statements you, you create around children so that whenever they are feeling what they are feeling, they have the ability to express it. Then you as an adult should now become, I tell parents that you don't become a thermostat, you are a thermometer. What that means is that for children particularly, children hasn't really developed the cap capacity to regulate emotion because their brains are not yet developed, fully developed. The brain is fully developed between the age of 25 and 30. Oh, okay. So you can see that children are still emotions and emotions. They're still moving. They're still trying to understand their world. Yeah. So you as an adult have the responsibility to help them regulate. So when they're on a 100, you try to bring it down for them. When they're on a 50, if it's too low, you, you, you hype it for them. So you are like term, term, thermometer. You are not a thermostat that once they throw their tantrums or what they begin, you, two, you just add your own and everything. So before you even have the capacity to regulate another person's emotion, you have to regulate, regulate your, own your own emotion, emotion as well. You must understand, you must learn. It's, it's a learned behavior. You must learn how to regulate your emotion. And the first thing is for you to understand that, see, how am I feeling? That's first. Why am I feeling this? What can I do as I'm feeling this? By the time you start thinking like that, you have won with your emotions. Okay, so now let's go to, because I, I saw a recent start about how the numbers, more women are depressed um, than men. So why, what, in Nigeria, the, uh, the thoughts I saw, well, why is this so? Why? Because you would have thought that because women are more expressive, we cry more, we talk more, we just more, we gossip more, that, you know, that we will be less depressed than, you know, than the men. Why, why is this um, so? Okay, so... Um... I will, talk, I will talk about this from neurobiology. So there is a research that has, uh, that has confirmed that the brain of the man is a bit different from the brain of the woman. And most times it's by nurture. You know, as human beings, we come into the world by nature, then nurture now comes in. So when we are growing up, there's this particular part of the brain of the female that is being raised or that is being nurtured more than that of the male. I hope I'll be able to explain this in a very basic form. What I'm trying to say is, you know, in our nurturing, parenting, society, environment, nurture the logical part of the brain of the male okay. more than the emotional part. And it starts with as simple as colors. When you we give birth to children, mm. there's this stigma, this stereotype of giving young girls pink. Pink and then, then give blue. Yes, and there's a psychology behind colors. If you don't grow with some particular colors, you may have little emotion. Let me give you pink an example. A, yes, pink is a very energetic emotion, and it brings sympathy. So if you are not raised with a pink color around you, 
you might not necessarily have sympathy for people mm. because colors have energy. So that is nurture. And there's a way the brain communicates with things around it. So if the brain doesn't see something that will nurture that part, then that place be becomes dormant. Do you understand it now? So, and as uh, the male is growing up, the female is growing up, there's this way, there's this um, double standard that we do. There's a particular way we raise the young girls and there's a particular way we raise the, It has an effect on the brain as well. And which in, in, in its own has an effect on the emotions of the male. That's why you see that women are more nurturers than men because there's this uh, attention on you're going to your husband's household you have to take care of your fire your in-laws they never tell that to men you have to do this and that helps the you know emotional part of the brain of the females more than the men yeah. now the statistics that you have said is quite right is because most of the time men have been conditioned to mask their emotions. I tell you, as a mental health practitioner, that men are more emotional than women mm. in a lot of things. But they don't show it. They hardly show it. It's, it's strange for you to see a young man on the road and the young man is crying. In fact, you are the person that says, ah, and you're a man, what's wrong with you? So he knows your response. He would rather not talk about it. But if you see a young woman, everybody will come and they'll start saying, oh, no, you know, say you'll be woman, you know, that kind of a thing. And that has really nurtured that um, neural pattern. We call it neural pattern of the brain. Mm -hmm. So much so that women are more emotional than physically emotional, you would think. But more so, men are more vulnerable and they are more emotional than men. Yeah, okay. Girls. Okay. So we have to go on another quick break. It's funny how you you know you have an interesting conversation like that. And then time is not your friend. But we have to take um, another quick break, and we'll be talking about. And when we come back from this, because we're talking now about the barrier entry into your field. Everybody now is a mental wellness expert. Mm. Go online, do something short. So how do we begin to um, differentiate and know that okay, this person, this person is certified person I can speak with, a trusted person I can you know relate with. We'll be right back after this. Thank you. You're still watching one on one, and our focus is on mental health. Okay, so now let's talk about the entry barrier for um, mental health. It's a good thing. I like um, the how there's a lot of awareness now. How there are a lot of coaches because I can remember a few years down the line, I had also experienced um, depression at some point, and there were not very many counselors and coaches like we see today. So I had to go to the federal um, hospital at um, Yaba, but there's a challenge with that because I feel like because of this now, a lot of quacks have come into the industry. Somebody, everybody's a mental wellness expert, everybody's a coach and then they can deal with this. How are you, um, the experts in the industry, how are you trying to regulate this? What, how do I know, for example, that this person, okay, I don't want to go to um, the psychiatric hospital in Yaba, but I want to speak to a wellness coach. How do I know that this person is a certified person and not a quack? Yeah. You know, for every field, we, it's not surprising that you always get people who leech on things like this and all that. But let me quickly educate people. You see, we have the academic part of mental health and we have the professional part. So, for instance, you could just decide to say, okay, you want to do some um, courses in counseling so that you could do basic counseling, help people around, which is fantastic. Okay, so a counselor is different from a psychologist, is different from a mental health practitioner, and is different from a psychotherapist. You know, we, they all have their um, area of specialty, depending on if it's academic or if it's um, professional, okay. okay? But the holistic or the, the umbrella of everything is psychology. So the mother of them is the psychologist and the psychotherapist. They have everything so it's under this psychology that you now have all the um, counseling the coaching everything bounces back to helping people right and to a large extent we have professional bodies 
we have professional bodies in Nigeria, we have um, professional bodies in counseling where you have the names and numbers or the details of everybody who is certified is everywhere on, 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 on the internet where you just okay. type in, you want to, you know, they will bring it out. You have okay. professional mental health prof uh, practitioners, they are there. You have professional coaches because coaches too are quite different from um, psychologists and they're quite different from counselors, but somehow they all work hand, hand in, in hand. hand, okay? So it is not um, unusual for you to get quacks. Okay. And one of the things that we are, that's why we are trying to push a lot of awareness because, you know, we are not used to these things from the beginning. Most times when people have um, issues surrounding their emotions and mental health, the next place they go to is to seek spiritual because I think there is yes. this link between spiritual and mental. I was going to get to that because mental. many people just see a religious counsellor and then we just, we, we um, demonize everything, you know, you re reject it in the name Mm. of the Lord and mm. we do all sorts and then we never mm. really get to the core mm. um, of the issue. So because we really don't have so much time, I want you to tell us, maybe just break it down like three or four practical steps on how to protect our mental health. How do I protect my mental health in my home, um, in my workplace, and just everyday life. Just share with us some practical steps. Thank on. you. So there's this thing that we call good body image. Okay. You know, you have to be real with yourself. If you are not real with yourself, you can't get yourself. What do I mean by that? Always look at the bright side of life. Everybody has their issues that they deal with. It is just the normal stresses of life. So when you are going through issues, look at the brighter side. It's not trying to uh, switch on you or because you see the brain has a way of the brain has been wired to always look at issues okay you know like i said the other time that there's they, this thing in our brain called the amygdala it's like a fire alarm it, it, it's the one that catches all the issues of life and tries to magnify everything for you but if you're not if you if you don't have a grip of what is happening to you it magnifies it it makes it bigger then you may not be able to handle it and that's where you have mental health issues and that's why it aggravates to illnesses okay so you should have the capacity to look at yourself and look at your vulnerab uh, vulnerabilities and your strength mm. and focus more on your strength everybody has vulnerabilities everybody have their strengths focus more on your strength talk more to yourself in fact that's another myth people think when you talk to self yeah, is the, you need to talk to self you need yeah. to have like a meeting to yourself sit to yourself that ask yourself questions look inwards I tell people that our work is not to find solution for you. You have to find a solution for yourself. But our work as psychologists and mental practitioners is to guide you. That's the skill that we have that you don't. You know, your, your uh, solution may be on this right side, but you are looking on the left side. So our own responsibility is to guide you towards that part where you will find self. We cannot find it for you. So always ensure that you manage your emotions. Never allow anything to i mean i'm talking about emotions that never suppress anything if you feel sad i tell you oh i feel somehow today i don't need you to say uh why no i just need to express it always make sure that whatever you feel however you feel you let it out mm. and you see you must always find someone to talk to no matter what find so if everybody needs a coach you must always find somebody to share your uh, issues with the back is a myth when people say oh uh, don't share your story with any the worst people can do is to share it around right but the thing is it, it's not it's not resident in you you have been able to express it because you see repressed emotion becomes toxic so it is even more about you than whatever anybody wants to do or want to say about your issues don't let it sit with you because it becomes an issue and that's where mental health illnesses comes in so Always let it out. Express, express, regulate. Okay, talk so, about it. Um, I have a, I have a, um, a question though. Should I say more of like a concern? Mm. I find that sometimes some people try to manipulate you with their mental health or claim that they have this mental health issue to get away with situations or get away with some things to try and just you know. So for example, I could just give an example and say, oh. You know, you want somebody to do some work and the person is coming every time like, oh, I'm just stressed. Oh, I'm depressed. I mean, and this is like the constant excuse day in, day out. So how do you begin to uh, draw the line? I know that, look, this person is 
truly just being a lazy person or, or, or okay, maybe truly this person is depressed. How do I, you know, as a layman, I'm not an expert, but how do I begin to now draw the line and say, okay, this person is being manipulative here and just being playing lazy or this person truly needs um, help? Most of the time, people who are depressed don't say it. Most of the time, from my experience in the field, you are the one that actually, so people cannot literally come to you and say, oh, I'm depressed. That's why I didn't come to work yesterday. No, it doesn't work that way. There are signs that you would see. They, sometimes even they don't say it. You, if you are the one that's so observant that you will not notice it around them, because whatever they are doing is fantastic to them. That's the irony of it. They don't even know that something is happening. Most of the time, it's another person. That's why we are, we are creating the awareness that look out for people, reach out to them, talk to people. Because most times, people who are depressed don't say anything. Mm -hmm. So when people come to you and say, oh, yes, I was depressed, I slept off. Like I said the other time, they you know, bastardize the word depression. True. You have to be, be clinically proven that you are depressed before you can say somebody is depressed. Okay, you can be in grief. You can be in sadness for over a period of time. But is it excessive? Is it consistent? Then we would now need to put some psychological assessment in place to now decipher. Is it mild? When we've understood that, okay, it might be depression. Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it critical? Okay? So most times what people go through is just sadness. It's not depression. Mm. Depression has to be clinically proven by a certified psychologist for you to know that, okay, this person is actually depressed. So most times, they don't even want to talk about it. You are the one that would see the signs, the symptoms, the behavioral pattern in the way they talk. For instance, you hear someone just talking about heaven every time. You hear someone just talking about death every time. You hear someone just talking about their grandfather that has been dead for so, you know, they just talk about weird things. You know, you see that there's an antisocial disorder. They don't want to go out. They don't want to interact. Sleeping patterns has changed. Eating patterns has changed. Or they are unnecessarily too happy. Because that can be tricky. So it is not everybody that is happy that has a good mental health. So a lot of them use that emotion as a cover-up so that you don't detect. So most of the time, they don't even want you to know. Yeah. So if somebody tells you, I'm depressed, that's why I didn't come to the office for three days, know that that is manipulation it's not depression okay thank you very much sadly we've run out of time we've run out of oh. really would like to have you um again to you know talk about our mental health because it's a very um in as much as a lot of people take it as a fad but it's a very essential um topic to have on thank you so much Bukila. thank you for having me and sorry. that's all we can take on one on one this week please ensure to take care of your mental health reach out to people check up with your friends see a therapist if you um if you need to and ensure that it's a satisfied one that's all for this one on one this week i'm fumi unwa jp